thanks for uh, joining this fourth and last session of our small symposium. So uh, it is. Uh, so uh, we will have two talks uh, this uh, for this last session. So a talk by uh, Julio. We start with a talk with uh, by Julio uh, Iroli, and we will have a talk uh, by Andrew Gordon Wilson. So uh, let me so introduce our first speaker, uh, Julio Biroi from uh, Ecodama uh, City of Paris. So he's going to tell us uh, about uh, things about the, the landscape. So bad minima, good minima, and rare minima. Okay, so uh, to you, uh, Julio. All right, thank you. So do you hear me well? All right, okay. So thank you very much for the invitation uh, to this uh, virtual online meeting. So what I would like to do, Today is to give you, I mean, a few perspective actually on the lost landscape. Again, this is by no means uh, our conclusions are more directions to think about. Uh, so as, as you will see, I, I will take point of view that come from statistical physics. So while very, I mean, very roughly, this has been discussed already several times. So uh, one of the big challenge in understanding the uh, lost landscape of neural network is due to the fact that this lost landscape is very high dimensional and in principle it's non-convex, it's quite complex. So high dimensional because the number of parameters is huge and then while well, it's non-convex because well typically it's, it's non-convex as a function of parameters. So the uh, actually in physics uh, we have uh, dealt with this kind of, I mean not the, not the same kind of landscape but there have been, I mean, a lot of works uh, that, that try to understand high dimensional non-convex landscape. In this case, the high dimensional means just that there are many, many particles interacting together or many spins. And the non-convexity comes in particular when you study disorder system. So while well, physicists have, have really tried to understand what is the shape uh, and all, what are the properties of this high dimensional non-convex landscape, at least some of them, and what is the dynamics in this non-convex landscape? In particular, if you start from a random initial condition, you let the gradient flow or gradient descent go, where the system is going to end up. And this is, well, very similar to the kind of questions that people ask in the case of neural networks, in which you have some optimization algorithm, typically gradient descent with some stochasticity, and then, and then you go down in, in the last landscape. So the kind of questions that people ask in the case of, um, uh, neural networks are what are the property of the landscape, what is the property of the training dynamics, what is the relationship of the minima that are found to generalization and, and also what, what kind of inductive bias you have in the dynamics. Now, these are partially questions that people have asked indeed in the case of, of dynamics of disorder system. So what I would like to do, I mean, the first part of my talk is about something which maybe has been discussed a little bit already. And uh, so, uh, in, again, in the case in physics, people have studied high dimensional landscape. Uh, and uh, I think this uh, gives you some lessons which are interesting. Of course, one has to be careful. The model that have been studying are not model of neural networks and have, are different in some aspects, but still they give some, some interesting, uh, one can find interesting results. So let me take really a caricature, which is of a, let's say, high, high dimensional non convex landscape in which you have a kind of function, let's call it loss or energy, and you have a part which is a completely random part, and then there is a part which corresponds to the signal. So it's good for the, for, for the system to, uh, uh, to go in the direction of the signal, which I call V0. And so, for example, you, well, what you can do, what has been done is the simplest case possible is you take the system of a sphere, of a d-dimensional sphere, when d go to infinity. This random part is just a Gaussian random function which has defined by this covariance, the mean is zero. And then, well, there is this term, which is this, the signal. So you have a competition between finding the signal and this, this, uh, this, this random part. So actually this in disguise, even if you don't see it, is a kind of spin glass model. And then generalization of this has been studied a lot. So in a geometric way, so you have the system, which is on the sphere, while you have the direction here of the signal, uh, again, a sphere in D dimension means that the majority of the points actually are here, are not in the, in, the, in the North Pole. And here, well, what you have is that, you know, in the energy, if you go in this direction, there is a minimum, but then there is also a random part, which is on top of this, which is given by this one. And then you can ask, depending actually of the strengths, uh, let's say here that you put a constant in front of this, and then you play with this constant, uh, then so how many minima do you have? 
is the ground state that you find here close to the signal. So maybe the ground state will be here because, well, even though without disorder, it will be here because of the disorder is here, or maybe it will be just destroyed completely by the disorder. And the other question is, if you start from a random initial condition, where well, the system is going to end up? And more generally, what are the geometrical property of the landscape? So this question, the nice thing is that you can answer this question precisely in, in, in this case, which I think is one of, I think of the few cases of let's say high dimensional non convex landscape in which you really can do, can have a complete characterization of the property of the loss or the energy and the property of the dynamics. So one method that has been used and uh, with, that Surya already introduced is what is called this cuts rice method. It's a method that has been, well, uh, introduce uh, to do a rigorous analysis in, in, in probability theory, in particular by uh, Finger, Benarus, and Cerny, but actually there were methods before introduced it by physicists. And in this way, what you can do, you can compute the number of uh, critical points uh, that have a certain index, they have a certain energy, and let's say they have a certain overlap with the signal. So you can really scan the, uh, the uh, energy landscape or the loss landscape studying the, the critical points. And while well, this can be done in a rigorous way, if you compute what is called the uh, annealed complexity, which means that you take the average of this number and you take the log and you divide by N, or actually you can compute what is more important. Uh, it's, you can compute the quench complexity. And so in this case, you have actually to mix this cut method with, with replica. So, uh, I don't know. Do you, are you using a pointer because I don't see it? If you... Yes, I'm using a pointer. I'm sorry, but yes, I move it. Uh, so I don't know exactly how to do it. Yeah, so we don't see it on the screen. So sorry. Thanks, for spotting. Uh, yeah, we see your pointer, pointer now. Now you see it. Well, it disappeared. It just disappeared. But we saw it. So if I do this, you see it? No. No. Uh, okay. Let me see now. No, no. Uh, well, well, okay. I think I will go without the pointer then. I will try. I, I will explain uh, by words. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah. So to, I mean, just to say that. Uh, so this, this kind of results, I mean, have been started long ago and then have been uh, have been pushed uh, done until uh, until now. And just to make a long story short. And if you look at the uh, uh, figures in the bottom line, so what you find is that in all this high dimensional non-convex non landscape in which you have disorder, so because, because of the randomness, the rule is that you always have exponential number of bad minima. It's really the rule. I mean, you really have to have a super strong signal to destroy the minima. So in this sense, I mean, this is, we can call, you can call it a curse of, of disorder landscape. You always have a lot of bad minima. And so the, the figure that you have uh, with this kind of spheres that you have on, on the bottom is, I mean, it's a caricature and uh, of some kind of uh, uh, some results that you find. So the R uh, is the uh, uh, signal to noise ratio. And so what you have on this in this sphere is that in the blue part is where you don't have critical points. The red part is where you have critical points. And then here, the North Pole actually is in this direction. And so what you, what you find is that if the, uh, the signal to noise ratio is small, you have a lot actually of critical points around the equator, which is where the, all the, uh, the majority of point lies. And then if you increase the signal uh, to noise ratio, then you find that you, while this band of, of critical points splits in two, so you have a band which is in the direction of the signal, but still you have a lot of actually critical point uh, close to close to the signal, and only when you go to very very strong signal to noise ratio, uh, then you find something which is completely blue. So you, blue, you have just one uh, global minimum. So from this point of view, it could seem that it's really hard actually to solve the problem to find the uh, the good minimum because you have an exponential number of med minima in this landscape. Now the nice thing is that this is not really uh, a, a problem. And this is if you you can study the gradient uh, gradient flow or gradient descent in this in this landscape with a technique which is called dynamical mean field theory that has been developed along the years, and what you find is that it's true if the you have low signal to noise which is the picture that you have on the left, then in the landscape while well, you have a lot of bad minima and actually they'll say the global minimum 
is not related to the signal or is buried within the bad ones and you cannot find. And so in this case, what you find is if you do gradient flow, the system ends up in one of these bad minima and actually it not even ends up. You have some kind of slow dynamics in which the system goes close, closer and closer to uh, subtle points with an index that, with, that becomes smaller and smaller. The smaller is the index, the longer is the dynamics, and actually the system has a dynamics which comes slower and slower, which is called aging in the context of in uh, statistical physics. So with the one figure that you have, I'm sorry that I don't have the pointer, but the, uh, the second figure uh, with the different color, the delta of TW, TW plus T is the mean square displacement, which tells you actually how much the configuration of time TW will be different from the configuration of time TW plus T. And so what you see here is that the more TW, the longer is TW, the longer it takes to the system to uh, decorrelate or to escape from, from the configuration. So really the system is going down, is going uh, towards saddles, which are of lower, uh, they are less and less unstable, is becoming stable and the dynamics go down. So this is the regime in which you don't find the signal. Now, if you increase the signal to noise ratio, what you find is that you find something which is slightly similar to something that was discussed before, but it's probably a caricature of what was discussed before. What you find is the system first goes through a search phase. So it goes down in energy. It goes toward one of these saddles or which have a very few direction to escape. And then at a certain point, it finds the direction toward the signal. And this is in this way. And then, it, and then, and then it goes, the energy really goes down. So what, this is what you have on the right. On the right, you have the behavior of the energy as a function of time. Uh, so the different curves from red to green corresponds to different uh, signal to noise ratio. So in the red case, you just are stuck in one of these bad minima. And then in, when the green case, you see that first you go down in one of these marginally stable saddles. And then while the system is able to find the direction and, and it escapes. Now, the interesting thing is that in, even in the case in which the system find uh, the minimum, so it escape, actually there are tons of bad minima. It's just that the, the system doesn't see them. So what happens in this case is that the characterization of critical point, you have uh, that the critical points are characterized. So they are very deep bad minima. And then you more you go up, you have, let's say, minima, which are more and more, and there are more and more fragile, let's say, less and less stable. And what these are the minima that attract the dynamics when you start from a random initial condition. So what happens is that when this minima actually becomes unstable toward the, uh, uh, toward the signal, this is when you start to recover, even though there are a lot of bad minima which, uh, which are there. And this is something which I find very interesting because it's something which that can happen only in very high dimension. So you have a system with a lot of bad minima. You start from random initial condition, but you never see them. You always go to the, to, to the correct solution. If you were in finite dimension, this would, would, would never happen. So while this is what happens in this kind of, let's say general, I mean, it's schematic model of a high dimensional random landscape with signal. And of course, as, as uh, it has been said already, these are not model of neural networks for sure. And clearly, if you go, if you want to go to neural networks, you have to put more ingredient or try to uh, really start to study simple model of neural networks. So this has been done. Start, I mean, it's 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 a program that has been started to um, be done from by physicists. So I'm just quoting uh, a few results. So there is the group of Zekina that uh, started to analyze uh, SGD uh, in simple model of neural networks and and. Uh, um, uh, and their point is that actually SGD in this simple model of neural networks, again, find minima, which are flat, even though there are a lot of bad minima, you find good minima with good generalization, which, which are wide and flat and rare. Uh, then you can also try to do exactly what I said before. So developing methods like dynamical mean field theory to study simple neural networks with, let's say, a few nodes. And this is something that has been done recently, in particular by Minya Kurban in Zdebarova. And actually, this dynamical mean field technique has been very recently proven to be rigorous by Montanari and Wu. And then you can also try, these are all methods that come from statistical physics, you can try to generalize this cuts right method to try to study the number of critical points for simple neural networks. And this is something that we did with Antoine Maillard and Gerard Benarus. But I have to say that at the end, even though we have 
construct the mathematical framework for the moment is so complicated that we don't have uh, uh, explicit results. So what I would like to do instead, instead of discussing this, this direction, I would like to change completely and try to say something about realistic networks. Now, in the case of realistic networks, well, exactly like in physics, in a sense, I mean, the system is so difficult that it's, it's difficult to say something uh, to do theory. So what you can do, you can try to do numerical experiments and then try to infer from the result of the numerical experiments property on the landscape. And this is what we did in, in, in this paper by Baitiesi and et al. So the idea is really the approach of a physicist. So we measure some dynamical observable that we know that in physics are useful to probe the landscape. And while well, we do the same in case of neural networks. So while the models that we studied are well from very simple to a little bit less simple uh, architecture from let's say fully connected to a small convolutional network. And we, we uh, use as images, I mean, with data images from uh, Cypher and Minst. And so, well, what you find, so here is just, I mean, it's just a collection of behavior of loss and accuracy for the different networks that we study. So you have the train loss, the test loss, the train accuracy and the test accuracy. You see that you have a behavior which is similar, kind of similar. So you have first a regime, if you plot as a log of time in which, well, you start to escape, let's say from your, the search, what we, we could call the search phase. And then the loss start to go down, really. I mean, the gradient probably is start to have uh, a, an important uh, absolute value. And then there is a, th a final regime with overfitting. I mean, this is kind of, I think it's, it's normal and, and found in, in many different cases. Now, what we did, what we did, we, we tried to study really this correlation function, two point correlation function that are studied in, in glassy physics and disorder system to probe whether the system is glassy or not. And this is this delta is this mean square displacement. So it's the displacements in the weights between time TW and time TW plus T. So what I show you before is that in the regime uh, in which uh, the system is glassy, and this is in general in physics, this curve actually what it does is that it never converge. So it means that the longer is the time, the longer it takes to the system to escape from where it is. And instead in cases in which the system is not glassy, this kind of curve, it converge. It has a kind of steady state dynamics. And here, what we see is that uh, with a different color, so the uh, violet is in the first regime of, of uh, dynamics, where in the search phase, then the red correspond to regime in which you, you go down and then the, uh, in, in the lost landscape, and then, the, uh, and then you have a kind of stationary dynamics in, 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 in the yellow case. In reality, the dynamics is not stationary because as you see, the mean square displacement is divided by the diffusion coefficient. And what is known is that uh, what we find and what uh, also is known is that actually the system uh, slow down uh, when it goes down in, in the lost landscape, just because it's, it, it's fitting more and more the data. So actually it has a drive, which is smaller and smaller. But the only, I mean, the bottom line of this exercise is that if you probe observable that show whether the system is glassy or not, has glassy dynamics or not, what you find in realistic networks is that dynamics is not glassy. It's clearly not glassy. And uh, the last landscape visited by the dynamics is certainly complex, but it's not rough. And I want to insist that it's the last landscape visited by the dynamics. It doesn't mean that there are, there are no bad minima somewhere. It's just that you don't, I mean, the system is not, is not uh, seeing them during the dynamics. And the dynamics that we find is something which is similar to a kind of diffusion on the bottom of the landscape with a diffusion coefficient, which actually decreased uh, in time. Now, is this the entire story? I think it's, I think it's this result is really due to the fact that networks are typically overparameterized. And in fact, if you take a smaller network, so if you underparameterize, so you keep the same number of data, but you decrease the number of parameter, then in this case here, the mean square displacement and the mean square displacement that you find is doing aging, is really showing you what I said before, the longer is the time, the longer is the W, actually the longer it takes to the system to, uh, uh, to decorrelate from itself. So you really have glassy dynamics, but while well, you are in the underparameterized regime. So clearly the fact of being in the overparameterized re regime, as is known from our study, it shaped the landscape in such a way that the system is not, is, is not glassy and it has a dynamics that brings the, the system to the bottom of the landscape. Okay, so this is the, uh, 
uh, is let's say one perspective that comes from this, the physics of disorder system about the, the uh, shape of the lost landscape and the dynamics within it. And I think there are many, many other interesting questions. Uh, but what I would like to do uh, in the following is to go in another direction. So I think it's something that I think it was, it was discussed also yesterday is that it, I think it's very interesting to try to understand the interplay between the lost landscape, the geometry of the lost landscape and the data structure and the network architecture. So somehow the data structure and the network architectures should shape and should give properties, some peculiar properties to the lost landscape. And I would like to give you again two, two uh, results in this direction, uh, which are more, let's say, to, uh, pro to provoke some, some thought about it. So the first thing that I would like to discuss is again to show you how complex is this is the lands landscape is the fact that imagine that I consider a fully connected network. Now, when I train this fully connected network, I, I get, I mean, I get some, some particular solution. However, I mean, I, one can think that there are some very rare minima which are extremely good in this landscape, but that the system is not able to find them. And one way to, to prove this point is that now imagine that I take a convolutional network, which I know that typically is much, I mean, it has an accuracy, which is much better than, than, than a fully connected network. And then I take this convolutional network and I embed it in a fully connected one. Meaning that I can always think that the convolutional network is a particular kind of fully connected in which I, I have imposed some constraint. And now, well, so in this, from this point of view, so in embedding the convolutional network within a fu fully convolutional uh, network, we can now study, try to study uh, the convolutional network as very rare minima in this, in this lost landscape. So the numerical experiment that we did which is described uh, in the left, is that what we do is that we keep the constraint of the convolutional network until a time TW, and then we leave the constraint and we let evolve the system as it were as if, as if it were a, a fully connected. And uh, so you can do it at different TW. You can just put the uh, constraint at the very beginning, uh, only in the initial condition, and then you let train the system as a fully connected or you can keep the constraint until a time TW and then you let it evolve in the full space, or you can keep it until the end. If you keep it until the end, the constraint, this is just the normal training of, of the convolutional network. And what you find in, in, in the right of my slides is the test accuracy. So the, the, uh, the line, which is uh, on the, uh, I mean, the bottom line of, of uh, 57.5 is what you get from a fully connected. And the, uh, the, the red dots are actually this, the result of this, of this numerical experiment. So the first thing you see is that if TW is zero, so if you just impose the constraint on the initial condition, already in that case, you, get, you gain a lot in terms of accuracy. Then the, the red point at the very left is when you don't, uh, when you keep the constraint until the very end, this is the convolutional network. And then you see actually that if you reach the constraint along the trajectory, Actually, you can even gain in test accuracy if you keep the uh, constraint of the uh, uh, convolutional network to your center at the, until a certain point, and then you release it. So the idea is that putting this constraint actually um, put in the, in, the, in the very so force the system to be in the very rare basin, and once you are in the very rare basin, then it's actually good to release the constraint in such a way that you optimize as much as possible. In any case, this was really something that I wanted to show you, to show you that, again, if uh, we, we often consider the lost landscape, which is visited by during the dynamics, but actually the lost landscape is much more complicated. It it's, can be full of rare bad minima, but can also contain rare, very good minima, like in this case. Now, again, go in, the, in this direction to try to make a connection actually between uh, the um, structure uh, in the data, the architecture, and the, and the property of the lost landscape, uh, I would like to, uh, well, to, 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 to ask the question whether, I mean, this rare minima, so that I just discussed, so this, this CNN, which are in the, within, this, uh, within the uh, space of this uh, FCN, the fully connected, are very rare solution. And one question that you can ask is, can you find them? 
I mean, what is the property of this minima that makes them so much better than the other? And can we find them from scratch? So of course, CNN have been found, uh, I mean, it's just using the property of, of the data and uh, fixing them in the architecture. But can one try to find them, let's say in an agnostic way from scratch? So this is a question that other people have asked and I think uh, have been maybe addressed also yesterday. Uh, so what I'm showing you in the uh, first uh, line of the slides are the final weights. So I have a network with some layers and I consider the weights, uh, uh, the, the input uh, weights in the, in, the, in the first layer. And here are the final layer weights uh, after training. And I'm showing you what, what you see. I mean, these are kind of, what you see here, you see that you have some kind of local mask, exactly as the one that you can, you could have in a CNN, but these are actually buried in the noise. So there are a lot of W which are different from zero. And then there are some Ws actually, which are quite strong that we assemble are the local uh, features that, that you find in CNN. And so, well, to try to answer to this question, can we find them from scratch? Well, we try to make a connection with uh, a technique which is called iterative magnitude pruning. And uh, which is what you do is that you take the weights after training, you prune the smallest weight, then you rewind uh, back. So you restart the dynamics uh, from the initial condition uh, that you had for this weight that survived the pruning and you retrain. And then once you have you train the prune network and once you have done this, you do it again, and then you do it again, and then you do it again. In this way, you can reduce a lot, actually, the number of weights. And surprisingly, actually, you can even increase the performance. So you, you cut weights and you increase the performance. But of course, if you just cut the weights without uh, going to the training, you wouldn't be able to, uh, uh, to get anything interesting because what you would do is that you would do exactly what I said before. You would go in the underparameterized regime in which the system actually is not able to find a good minimum. So what you have in the uh, figure uh, in the bottom uh, left, is the, uh, the accuracy, which show you that the, when you prune, you can really prune a lot and you can increase the accuracy. And once you do this, if you go on the right and you look, look at the mask, the masks that you have are actually masks that are really have features like the one in, in, in CNN. They are, I'm not pretending that these are exactly like CNN, of course, you cannot not have translation invariance, but the locality, uh, you start to get it. So you're really cleaning uh, this, the, this mask uh, from, let's say, the, the, the noise that you have at the beginning. So uh, what I would like to say is that from this perspective, what pruning is doing is like denoising in a sense. And in order to actually to put forward uh, this perspective, what we did is that we tried to play with the number of data. So if what's going to happen is this uh, benefit of pruning how it's going to behave when you increase the number of data or when you decrease the number of data. And this is what is shown in, 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 the, first, uh, in the first plots in, in, on the top. What you see actually, if you decrease the number of data, actually, if you prune, then you lose this benefit of pruning. And if you look actually to the mask, you will see that you are not able actually to retrieve local mask. And similarly, actually, if you try to reduce the semantic value of the task, you will find something very similar. So the way in which you reduce the semantic value of the task is that instead of taking classes in which, I don't know, all dogs are, are, are dogs, we take random classes, so uh, the, the way in which I show you in the figure. And so if the classes have no meaningful meaning, what you see again is that, well, the system is, is not actually able to learn. And again, it's, the pruning has no effect. And if you look to the mask, the masks are not local. So this is just to say that Pruning, in a sense, really what it does, I mean, it's, uh, if there is, the, there is the, the signal to noise ratio is large enough, then it's able actually to denoise the system, is able to cut off this noise and to make actually this, uh, this mask and this local feature emerge. So from the point of view of the landscape, what pruning is, is doing is that in the, from, in the landscape, when you start from a random initial condition, you have a lot of weights which are just noise. They, does, they don't really are, uh, uh, are useful, but they are there. And then they, in, in, they amper actually the evolution of, of the good ones, which are related to the fit really with, with the structure of data. And so, well, if pruning what it does, it just it kills progressively all these, let's say, uh, 
uh, unuseful direction, unuseful weights, and then, for, and then it leaves the, uh, the weights which are important and which match with the structure. So, well, this is what I said at the end, saying that the inductive bias in this spray pruning is really related to, in a certain sense, to the noising and cleaning the landscape. Now, well, I would like actually to, to stop actually just uh, giving you three directions. This uh, is against binomials and its conclusion is really a perspective. I think uh, there are a lot of things to understand. And uh, I find very interesting this, it's a very uh, unusual property of high dimensional non converts or high dimensional disorder landscape, which has at the same time, they bring some curse, but they also bring some blessing. Uh, there are clearly, I think, very interesting things to do to try to understand what are the properties of the bad, the good, and the rare minima of the lost landscape. So for example, one question that I find interesting, but I don't know the answer is, now if I think that the CNN, I show you that the CNN can be thought as very rare, good minima within the FCN landscape. And there have been a lot of discussion in the literature about the fact that uh, good minima are the ones which are wide and flat, much more wide and flat than the others. Well, from this point of view, well, I, what, what happens? So this, this is this are the CNN much more wide and flat in, within the uh, space of, of the uh, FCN. And then the other direction, again, that I find interesting is trying really to put together these two perspectives, the lost landscape, the property of the lost landscape in, on the one hand, and actually how the data structure and the architecture actually shape the landscape to give rise to the minima that are important to, to obtain a good generalization. And with this, I, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Julio, uh, for this uh, inspiring talk. So uh, are there questions from uh, members of the audience or the panel? Yes, uh, a few questions. So uh, let's uh, start with Wolfram. Um, yeah, th thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, regarding these uh, sort of the, 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 you find these receptive fields or, or or sort of features of that are that, that are uh, via pruning that are features that are typical for convolutional networks, and uh, it's easy to show this for the input layers because there we know what we are looking for, and in a way, uh, sort of standard unsupervised learning will give you exactly the same features, but uh, with unsupervised learning, it's very hard to get something in the second, third, and fourth la uh, layer, and moreover. I wouldn't, even if I got something, I wouldn't know how to interpret this. So can you say it about sort of with your pruning method, you say it's sort of effective, you're doing denoising. So what is it doing in these middle layers? So, so what you get in the, uh, well, okay, we didn't do many layers. We did something like uh, five layers and we see that the more you go deep, actually the more the mask becomes actually, well, it's, you can, you have something which is, still local, but which which a larger receptive field. So uh, so actually it seems to work even for the, for example, for the second and the third layer, uh, once you prune. But then again, then the, the problem is that you see, I mean, it's the problem is that this idea of embedding the CNN within an FCN has limitation because the FCN is huge. And so, and so we cannot really go, I mean, we cannot, take, uh, let's say, state of the art of CNN. But from what we can see is that, I mean, also from the, for the second and the third layer, we have the same uh, qualitative results. Thank you very much, Surya. Uh, yeah, thanks, very interesting talk. Um, I had a question about the, the situation where, you know, you, uh, you have exponentially many bad minima, but the dynamics doesn't see them and it goes to the good minimum. This implies that the volume of the basin of attraction, the, the volume of the basin of attraction, the good minimum, is larger than the volume of the union of the basins of attractions of exponentially many bad minima. I'm, I'm wondering, has somebody shown, uh, been able to show that using some static landscape analysis? So, that... okay, well, uh, okay, let, let's see in this way. So what you can show, at least in simple case, is that the, uh, uh, the basin of attraction of the, uh, you can ask what is the basin of attraction of, of the bed minima that traps the dynamic. And what are the, uh, and, I mean, what are the bed minima that traps the dynamics? And there are the ones which are the more marginally stable with the widest basing of attraction. And then what happens is that 
if you increase the signal to noise ratio, these are the ones, since they are marginally stable, are the ones that become unstable the first. Uh -huh. So this is why actually, and then you escape and then you go to, to the good minimum. So in this way, yes, the good minimum is the one with the largest basing of attraction because you know that it comes from the instability of the bed minima that had the largest basing of attraction. I see. But, but I guess my question is more about at the signal to noise ratio, it, what I thought you were saying was at a certain signal to noise ratio, you have coexistence of exponentially many bad minima yeah. and uh, one, good, one good minimum. Mm -hmm. And yet you still find the good minimum yeah. at that signal to noise ratio. So yeah. it's clear that if you increase the signal to noise ratio, the most least stable minima will vanish or, 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 or disappear. Mm -hmm. But I'm still wondering about how the, these two things can coexist at a fixed SNR, yet mm -hmm. the dynamics doesn't see the exponentially many bad minima. So uh, you're right. I mean, in a sense, it's, it, I mean, it's certainly true. The, uh, the basing of attraction of the good minimum is larger of the, uh, the union of all the basing of attraction of the bad minima. And this, you can show it because you solve the dynamics, so, so you, 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 know, you know it. But it's true that from the aesthetic point of view, I think it's a super hard question because it's a non-local, so, so yeah, it's, it's yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I may have a question if anyone has. So, uh, I mean, one way to look at uh, convolutional networks as fully connected networks is, is their training. You could imagine that instead of, you know, uh, you, you initialize in a kind of symmetric fashion, which is the way you initialize the convolutional nets and then the gradient you kind of project on the du direction that, to, that corresponds to the symmetry of the CNN. Uh, so uh, have you ever studied like, you, you know, what, what happens if you kind of restrict, you, you project the gradient onto some directions? I mean, can it somehow help uh, in some cases uh, for a system like the ones you considered to, to so reach the minimum? And then, so, so you mean you project the gradient? You, you, then... you project the gradient and you follow, you, you follow the, grade, the projected gradient instead of the gradient. Right? Yes. And this, yeah. this is equivalent to, uh, to, to, to enforce the, uh, uh, isn't equivalent to enforce the constraint? No, no, that, that's right. But okay, more generally speaking, if you, if you, if you put some, some projection constraints, I mean, the projection may change uh, you know, across yeah. face or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so in a sense, this is yes, is what we tried. Yeah, was what we did in a sense, right? It's the, uh, it's the, uh, is that projecting the constraint brings you in direction in which you will never go otherwise. That's right. But I, I was wondering about uh, this these models you presented at the beginning. Uh, can you, you know, have you looked at this question in that context? Ah, for the for the one the model in the run now. Right. 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 Let me let me think. It's but in principle, uh, so whether projecting the no no we we didn't and I think the reason is also that the um, so in the model that I present at the beginning they are so featureless in a sense because I mean it's there is no I mean there is no structure uh, so here when we when you project is that because you know that you are training with data and this data somehow I mean. Are, uh, have something which is related to, to the way in which you are projecting the gradient. Uh, and instead, in the, in the, I think the model that I present at the beginning were ju are just too simple. So, but I think it would be very interesting to have some, uh, some solvable model in which one can do something like this. Okay, thank you. So there's a question of Emanuele uh, in the Q&A uh, chat. So great talk. Have you also tried to do the other way around, i.e. starting from a small network, creating its weight, adding new ones, Time by, one, uh, time by time to see if also in this case there is an improvement in the performance. So, kind of uh, so no, uh, so I, I didn't. Uh, my, my impression is that, uh, or if you understand uh, well, the, uh, the question is that this is not going to, I mean, of course, I mean, if you add the sort of, I mean, it's uh, uh, okay, I think the, the question is interesting, but somehow once you are. Uh, when you have a small number of parameters, indeed you are, you are going to be blocked in bad minima. And I think once you are blocked in a bad minimum, if you take this as an initial condition, even if you add more parameters, this is a kind of bad inductive bias. 
So I, I remember one experiment, I don't remember who did it, but for example, in which you train a system uh, on shuffled uh, labels, and that, so you get one, uh, you get, uh, uh, one solution, and then you start from this solution, to, you retrain the system now with good labels. And if you do this, actually you find something which is bad. So it means that again, the initial point, when we take an initial point, which is at random, is actually it's a good initial point to start with. And if you start from a bad initial point, then you find a bad minimum. So my impression is that if you do uh, what, uh, Manuel, if you do what you, what you say, my impression is that we would start from an initial point, which is, which is bad. So this is, so it wouldn't give a, a good result. Very interesting. So uh, thank you very much. Is there a uh, last question from anyone? We are just on time. Okay, so if not, uh, uh, we have our second speaker for this afternoon session. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your participation.